Hi, everybody, and welcome to this presentation about uh, Graphics View. Graphics View is a new framework uh, released in 4.2, which uh, we released like last week. So it's uh, pretty brand new, but it's been in, in a preview phase for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So some of you may have tried it out already. How many are familiar with, at least roughly, with the Graphics View framework? A few. How many know QCanvas? Quite a lot more. OK. I think this is feeding a little bit. Can you just fix that? Sound guy? Anyway, my name is Gunnar Schletta. I'm a senior developer at Trolltech. Um, on my spare time, I play uh, violin and keyboards. But the reason I'm here today is because I'm a cute developer. And uh, in the past, I've done, um, I've done uh, some QSA maintenance. I was one of the architects behind the Arthur uh, graphics subsystem uh, architecture. And one of my main responsibilities in that area was the Windows uh, painting subsystem, uh, what is called the raster engine, which is our software implementation. And I also did uh, things like the gradients, uh, the stroker, uh, transparency, anti-aliasing, all those kind of things uh, I was involved with. I have to say sorry for this image because uh, it was really Andreas, the guy that did graphics view, that, that wrote this presentation. And he had only one picture of me, which was taken in uh, Chicago last year when I was really jet lagged and didn't want to be taken a picture of. So, so graphics view. Um, a, a, an image says more than a thousand words, right? So, um, so what I did is I, I just created this, uh, this, uh, this scene, which is some 10,000 items uh, rendered in different, uh, different opacity, different colors, different shapes, on top of a marble, marble background. It's so like this is graphics view. But a bit more seriously, um, what is this um, graphics view? Um, it's Qt 4's replacement for the Qt 3 canvas. Uh, so we're going to look a little bit about what is what we define as a canvas. Um, then we're going to look a little bit more about the details of the Graphics View framework, like which features are there, which classes exist, and how to use them. Then we're going to go through a little uh, small tutorial uh, and show you at least some, uh, some of the basic steps to get, uh, to get your application using Graphics View up and running. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, porting from QCanvas at the very end. So in the background, a canvas, if you look it up on like Wikipedia or something, you will find that one of the definitions of a canvas is a piece of material on which a painting is made. Of course, we are not, we are not, we are not painters or graphical, uh, graf we're, not, we're not artists in that sense. We are graphical artists. So a canvas for us is a widget with which we can work to do our graphical uh, views. So it's something like, you can compare it to like SVG, a charting application, a CAD view, a game, a number of different things. It's something that helps you visualize the data that you have available. And you can claim that you can do this with just a plain painter API, but this is not necessarily straightforward. How many of you saw my presentation on effective graphics programming last year? Not that many. Well, the point is that um, the point is that if you're using a sequential procedural API like QPainter, and you say draw a line, draw a line, draw a line, draw a line, then you end up calling draw a line for all those millions of lines in your application. While if you have a higher level, higher level abstraction, you can look at the geometry of your data set and say that I'm only looking at these lines down here, not the lines over there or over there. So you can draw only those lines. So you need some abstraction layer above this pure graphics API that will help you handle large data sets, help you do interaction, drag and drop, movement to those kind of things so that you don't have to implement that for all your use cases. So what does other frameworks define as a canvas? Well, in Java and TK, uh, the original canvas was just a way to write a custom widget. In GNOME, um, they define a component for higher level structured 
graphics. So an item-based API that can do that can do sort of rendering of a scene. Q3, uh, we had the QW sprite field, uh, which later turned into QCanvas. A QW sprite field was uh, were originally a um, a solution put together um, to implement uh, QNetHack, if you're familiar with that game. So um, that's like the origin of QCanvas today. But what it turned into is that it's a, it's a solution that can draw items on top of a 2D surface. And there's uh, just a small comparison on how these, how these um, different uh, frameworks view their own API. Now the GNOME Canvas has this documentation that it's optimized for hundreds of items. QCanvas in Q3 has in its documentation that it's optimized for thousands of items. QGraphics view it can easily do a million. So back to Q3 Canvas. It is an item-based API. Um, provides pix maps, polygons, bezier curves, and the option of uh, implementing some custom items. It provides a scrollable view and it's, it provides the option of transforming uh, the entire scene. However, it missed support for many of the things that we felt uh, it was being used for. Things like item interaction. In order to move an item around on the screen, you would have to actually implement a number of virtual functions and move the item manually. If you wanted to do item grouping, it was similarly complex. You have to implement your own item that grouped other items and like all kinds of nasty things. Still doable, but not convenient. Advanced controls like embedding a line edit or a text uh, edit inside a Q canvas, not so trivial. And um, accelerated rendering. Uh, if you used Q canvas to show pix maps and you zoom this in and out, you probably experienced that, th that this wasn't really fast. So accelerated rendering, being able to actually say that this canvas should render using OpenGL and use full hardware acceleration all the way is something that we just couldn't do. Now on the, on the other side of that, you have the fact that if you're zooming in your data set, you're viewing it and you're zooming out and out and out and out and out, the data becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and the details become less visible. So you might want to skip drawing some things because they won't be visible anyway. This is like level of detail. Um, and that information was not available uh, in the old QCanvas. Same with selections and item transformations. So all in all, we felt that QCanvas was probably or wasn't quite the right class for what it was being used for. So this is like the reason that we now sat down and did something quite different. Similar concepts, but a different implementation. So moving on to the graphics view framework. Talked about an overview, talked about this, the item, the scene, and the view. These sort of the three components that come together to form this framework. A little bit about the, the features that we have in there. So the graphics view fits our definition of a canvas. You start out with an item. Now an item is like, consider that you have a salad. Um, and um, you have in the salad you have like pieces of tomato, you have perhaps a falafel in there, you have like a cucumber or something like that. These are all small items that sort of come together. And they together, they will form a scene, which sort of is the, the entire salad, and then you, can, then you can render this using a view. So let's look at the items first of all. Now the items, um, one of the big changes in, in Q, Q graphics view as opposed to the old Q canvas is that it's floating point based all the way. So you can actually do sub pixel and sub um, like floating point based um, calculations and floating point based graphs and all those kind of things using this framework. All items can have transformation. And um, following that is also that all items operate in their own local coordinate system based in zero, zero. So if you're drawing uh, like this circle up there, this torus, you actually are drawing a circle that starts in zero, zero, which is very nice because you don't have to think about the X and the Y coordinate of this item. You just draw relative to zero, zero. 
So if you're drawing a circle, for instance, on the radius five, you just draw it from minus five to five. You don't have to worry about that as moving from this position to this position down here. Stuff like that. Now the graphics items operate on two different kinds of shapes. The, the, the most basic shape is the bounding rect. Now the bounding rect is used uh, for the graphics view when it's drawn to sort of define that this is the this is the big this is the smallest shape or smallest rectangle that encapsulates this entire item. The shape, on the other hand, uh, is sort of a closed shape that sits very tight to the edge of the item that can be used for hit detection. So if you're hovering over an item and you need to know if the mouse is over this item or not, then you would use the shape. But if you're just going to repaint this item, you would use the bounding rect. And a visualization of how this works is that if I have this item, um, this polygon that looks like this POW thing from the Batman movies uh, back in the 70s, then you have this thing, it's located in zero, zero. It has a bounding rect that is this rectangle that encapsulates this shape. And the shape is the actual shape that I'm drawing, this polygon. So if I'm going to implement my own custom graphics item, what is the least thing I need to do? Well, the first thing I need to do is uh, I need to implement the bounding rect because I need to tell the graphics view framework how big is this item. So I return here a rectangle that is, starts in minus 50, minus 50. It's 100 by 100 big, so it's like a rectangle that is 50 uh, pixels on each side of the, origin, of the origin. And then I implement the paint function to paint this item. And if you've, if you've, um, if you've used the style API, you will see some similarities between this paint function and the paint function in the style API. It is passed to QPainter that has set up the transformation to make sure that you're now in your own local coordinate system with the proper transformation set up. Can you please turn off that cell phone or that thing? Thank you. And then we pass it a QStyle option graphics item, uh, which is an option that contains like um, the state of this, uh, of this uh, item. Is it hovered? Is it selected? Uh, is the mouse being clicked? Um, like all the kinds of things you would need um, to decide how to render this. Even the level of detail is in that uh, style option. And then I just call paint to draw rect. As I said before, the items can be transformed. So you can set an item, you can tell an item to be just rotated or scaled or translated, shared, whatever you need to do. And you can also group items together. So you can have, um, if you consider like an arm, you can say that I have an arm that contains of an, an elbow, a lower arm, and a hand. And if I rotate like the hand here, and I then rotate the shoulder up and down, the transformation for this follows. So it's easy to make things like joints and, uh, and dependable transformations like that. You just make that this item is a, is a children of the other one, and then it just propagates nicely. So just a simple example of how these transformations can work. Start out uh, with no transformation. I rotate by 45 degrees. You see the coordinate system is still now the same. Uh, the item is still the same relative to its own coordinate system. If I scale it down, you see that the entire coordinate system scales down. The item stays the same in this coordinate system. It's just the coordinate system that changes. The drawing code for this is still now the same. I can rotate again, and uh, yeah, went a little bit too fast. So uh, all in all, the graphics items, um, they provide features like level of detail. You can actually decide, when you get the paint function, you can check like how, from which distance am I watching this item? And uh, if it's close, then I render the entire thing. If it's far away, I strip it down and render something much simpler. It provides, using the shape function, you can do things like collision detection. You can see if two shapes overlap, stuff like that. There is, um, we also implemented full event delivery for these items, so you can implement the graphics, uh, implement like the mouse move event for a graphics item. And then you can say something like set hover events enabled, and then when you hover over the items, you get the mouse move events, and you can change the foreground color, for instance. All these kind of nifty uh, features that I think uh, think you'll benefit from in the long run. 
other things to make these items behave more like like real components, uh, cursors, tooltips, drag and drop. And um, this example that I showed earlier with this rectangle, I could have implemented that using a, uh, one of the standard items that we provide. We provide lines, ellipses, polygons, rectangles, paths. We also provide an SVG item to render SVG files directly in a graphics view. We provide a simple text item, and we also provide a, a text editor component. Well, the text editor, editor component is pretty cool because what we did is that we, take, we took the um, we took your text edit and we split the implementation in two. So we just have like the widget front end, and then we had like the text document driver back end, which does all the event propagation. Like here comes a keyboard click. What does this happen? What it moves the cursor up or down? It inserts a character here or there. So when we have sort of split that up into two parts, we could easily take the widget part out and replace it with a graphics item part. So what you can do with uh, the text item is that you can actually say that like here I'm, wrote, um, here I'm having this, uh, this, uh, this editable HTML text. So you can actually do live text editing and then you can apply transformations and flip it around and do stuff like that. So well, some pretty nice features, I think. Moving on to the scene. Now the scene is, you have all these items. Together they form some sort of data set, some sort of visual representation that is, uh, that is um, supposed to make sense to the people that view it. So it can be something like a chart, it can be this, this silly salad. But all in all, it is the container for all the items. It's the global coordinate system, like the big thing. Some of the things it provides is, um, is like fast item discovery. If you, if you know that the user clicks someplace, uh, you need to quickly figure out which items are intersecting this particular click point. What item are you clicking on? If you have 10 million items, doing a linear search through that uh, is pretty slow, so we need something that is a bit faster. So we have all these kind of things. And um, we also have some, um, some uh, convenience functions in the scene to make it easy to do printouts and to do screenshots. And I'll actually show an example of how to do that a little bit later. So the scene is composed of three different layers. Uh, first of all, it's the background layer, which you can specify using the virtual function draw background, uh, which you can use to draw a grid, for example, a, uh, a tile background, a texture background, or we can use the convenience function uh, for setting the background brush. If you just have a, a gradient background or a, um, or a tile background, you can just use the gradient brush for that, or the, the background brush for that. The middle layer is the item layer. This is where first you draw the background, then you draw all the items. And on top of that, you draw the foreground color or the foreground brush, either using the virtual function draw foreground or by using the foreground brush. And one thing that I didn't mention earlier is that actually inside the item layer, there is a number of layers as well, because items can have a Z value. So you can say that this item should be rendered on top of this other item and this on top of that again. The Z value is just a double, so it can be any, any value. It renders from like uh, the lowest one renders first and then the highest one at the, at the end. So how this works, you start out with this, all these items, uh, in a global scene, global coordinate space, all themselves operate with their own local coordinate system, like that. And all in all, you end up with this like this huge thing, which is which is your scene, your graphics view. So again, the geometry of this graphics view is a floating point based system. Um, it's possible to specify a scene rectangle, like uh, you can specify that it can be um, X number of like um, uh, units, uh, tall or high or wide and high. If you don't specify a scene rectangle, the graphics scene will figure that out by itself, that you have items from here to here, from here to here, and will make a default scene rectangle that encapsulates all your items. So you don't have to set this, and this value is not like a hard-coded thing but it's a real coordinate system, it's floating point based. Uh, the indexing or the, the fast item discovery is implemented using a BSP tree. 
And for those of you who have ever done game programming or similar, a BSP tree is like the standard in game programming for doing, for doing uh, geometry, basically. It provides a very fast uh, method for finding uh, or locating points that are in a certain region of space. And just to illustrate quickly how it works, basically you take the entire scene, you split it in two, uh, uh, you split it in two horizontally, then you split those two segments in two vertically, again, and again, and again, and you sort of end up with this, with this, with this binary tree of uh, up and down, left and right, something looking like this, where you have at the end a list of items that intersect this particular region. So by, by, by using this tree, we get a logarithmic lookup of all items. So it means it scales pretty well. The downside, of course, is that if an item moves from one part of the scene to another, you need, you need to sort of move it inside this tree. So if you have a lot of movement, uh, you have the option of turning off the BSP tree because then, then this doesn't help you so much. I mentioned uh, some convenience function for printing. And um, this is the function graphics scene render. Basically, it takes a target rect and a source rectangle. So you basically say that given a painter open on a printer or on a fix map, render yourself to this here using this source rectangle. So you can take a sub part of a scene and draw it into a fix map or uh, draw it to a printer. And by default, it will try to fill the entire thing. So if you just have a scene and you want to print the entire scene, you just say render onto this painter, which is open in a printer. And the whole thing goes just to the printer. So a simple, uh, some code snippets to show how this works. Starting up with a printer, you open a print dialog, open a painter on the printer, and you say scene.render. That's all it takes. The pix map that is shown up there will now be drawn, scaled up to the entire page. Same approach for the, uh, for the, for the screenshot. You create an image, open a painter on the image, send the painter to the render function, and it just works. And now we could also have done, I could also have passed along rectangles for the source and the destination to only create parts of the graphic scene into parts of the image if I needed to, or if I wanted to. So then we move on to the view. Now the view is the sort of the, that is the widget that represents or that visualizes the scene. Can anybody guess which function it uses? Hmm? Uh, Float and uh, scroll bars are integer based in Qt. Hmm? Well, it uses the graphics scene render function, of course. Um, so it can be used. Uh, it can be used to visualize the whole scene or part of the scene. Um, and since the scene is just a model, um, you can have multiple views viewing the same scene from different angles, from different uh, transformations at the same time. And you also have the option from a scene or from a graphics view to, to, to rotate the scene in an, in an arbitrary. Uh, arbitrary transformation. So the way to get a graphics view up and running, a basic example, you create a scene, you add a pix map or some other item to the scene, and then you construct a graphics view, pass it the scene in the constructor, say view.show, and there you have your pix map. So given that I have a scene like this, uh, X number of items in various positions. I put this into a view, then I can like scroll back and forth. Basic stuff. So on to the sort of the, a little bit cooler things. <clears throat> um, with Qt4, we open up the option of opening a Qt Painter on a Qt print on a on a QGL widget, meaning that when you are opening a painter, or when you get to the paint event of a QGL widget, and you say painter.drawline, this actually expands to a GL line call. So you get, you get the hardware-based uh, rendering uh, underneath QPainter. 
So what, what you can do with QGraphics then is that you can, instead of using the default viewport, which is a normal, a normal Q widget, you can replace this with a QGL widget. And uh, what happens then is that when the, when, the, when, the, um, when the graphics scene renders onto this viewport, it will actually use the QGL widget to render instead, which means that it will be hardware accelerated and all that. And the way to do that is pretty straightforward. You just call view.setViewport, pass it a new QGL widget, and that's it. It will set it up to the right size, do all that kind of stuff. And now this graphics view will be hardware accelerated. If you want to have a multi-sampling enabled and tail um, you will probably want to specify that by using a different QGL format. Uh, so you specify sample buffers and pass that format to the QGL widget, and you have, and you have multi-sampling enabled for that QGL widget, and and filling in your graphics view. And of course, since by the time you get to this uh, to the paint call of this item, and you know that this is now that this painter has been opened on a QGL widget because you specified sometime earlier that you set the viewport to a QGL widget, well, you now know that okay, I'm painting onto a QGL widget, so I can instead of doing a painter call, I can do a raw GL call. So I can say do set the color to, to some color. I can do a GL uh, rect F. I can do something else. I can do a tri strip or whatever. Um, I would, however, caution you to uh, to push and pop matrices at this point, because uh, because this this framework sort of relies on uh, that transformations are in place. So if we're going to do that, at least put a save and restore at the end. Otherwise, uh, drawing will be probably pretty weird. Right. Uh, another thing, um, the Q the Q graphics scene has a virtual function called draw items that lets you draw all the items. So if you know that all your items are um, all your items are, can be drawn using OpenGL, you can actually implement this function, the draw items function, and draw all the items in the inner loop. And you can optimize away things like state uh, state updates and that to make it really really fast. Then I thought I was going to show you just a little demo on how this can actually work in practice. So here I have a simple graphics view. I'll just show you like the features that I have in this particular demo, and then I'll walk through the code afterwards to see what you need to do to actually get to this point. Now this widget is zoomable. You can see that as I zoom from this level, to this level, the items become transparent. That's a level of detail trick that we did. If I'm zooming out, you see that the arrows disappear, and then the lines disappear, and then the outlines disappear, and at some point, they turn into rectangles rather than, than circles. There is a tile background. I can do selection. There is a hovering effect. Uh, so when I'm hovering over items, they change. I can do selection, drag things around. I can rotate the scene if I want. And I can grab an item and rotate the item individually. No, this is based on the software engine. So basically, that's, um, that's the example. And the, the code that I need to get here um, is basically, I start out with a graphic scene. I add 25,000 items to it. And I, spe and I specify random colors. And I specify that these items should be movable. That means that I can, I can click on it and I can drag it around. So by saying that flag, I'm enabling that feature for this item. I'm saying that this item should be selectable which means that when I click on this item, the selected flag in the style option will be set when it's clicked. 
or when it's selected using uh, some uh, using the rubber band, for instance. Then I set the position to the position, and I add this item to the scene. No, the, the set flag uh, will or itself into the existing set. Uh, I assume there is a set flags that will actually replace it. So what I do then is that I create a view, uh, a custom view. I set the render hint on this to be QPainter anti-aliased. Um, the reason why I can't use QRender hint, uh, QPainter render hint anti-aliased on the QGL widget is that in order to do anti-aliasing on a QGL widget, I actually need full multi-sampling. So that's, it depends on a different kind of thing. But since I'm not using a normal widget, I can actually use the default, the default anti-aliasing hint. Then I specify that the drag mode should be a rubber band drag, which enables me to have this rubber band selection in the graphics view. And then I set the background brush to be the, this tile, this, uh, this little brick thing I had. Then I show it. So if I look at the item then, uh, this item, uh, it has a color as you saw down there. I set the set accepts hover event to true. This means that this item will now get mouse events when I'm moving the mouse into the item and out of the item. So I can do so I can do things like updating the uh, updating the widget uh, widget's foreground color. So I can do like this this hovering effect that you saw that it actually turned lighter when I went, the mouse was over it. The bounding rect function pretty straightforward. Same with the shape. The paint function. I have a painter, I have this option, and I have this, vid, this extra widget pointer. Now the widget pointer is something that you should never ever use. It's just there for uh, doing really nasty hacks. Hmm? Hmm? Where? The widget is the viewport. So it's, it's this thing that is currently being rendered on. So the reason why you shouldn't use it is that what if you're then taking a screenshot, and of course the screenshot is rendered onto a Q image, and um, suddenly you don't have a widget. So, I mean, it's 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 guaranteed. It's not guaranteed to be a valid pointer. Uh, it's it can it can be used to do nice animation effects, uh, like the push button on the Mac, for instance, has this like glowing effect, right? Uh, this is using the Q widget pointer in Q style, which also means that you cannot do the glowing effect on any other kind of thing. So um, it's, uh, it's there for nasty hacks, that's it. So anyway, I fetched a level of detail. It's the first thing I do, and I set a few, um, and then based on this level of detail, I draw this item a little bit differently. Now the first thing is that if I'm, if I'm closer to one, or if, I'm, if the level of detail is greater than one, I set the opacity. Now greater than one is probably what does that mean? Well. If, an item, if the level of detail is one, it means that you're viewing this item in its default transformation, like with an identity matrix. If you scale this by a factor two, then the level of detail should be two. So then you're like, then you're zoomed in. So if it's greater than zero, then you're zoomed in on this item. You're actually like closer to it than the default. So I use this, I set the opacity. Uh, the QPainter set opacity call is a new call we implemented for Qt 4.2 which will basically set the opacity for every um, following call made to QPainter. So if you wanna do something like fading a pix map in, you can do that by just setting the, the opacity on Painter, then draw the pix map, setting a different opacity on the Painter, draw the pix map, and then just like gradually increase the opacity and you will have a pix map fading in. After that, if the, um, if I'm, if the mouse is currently over this item, that is what I get from this, uh, this hover event that I enabled, then I will draw it with a slightly lighter brush. So I set the brush to be uh, the color, but a light version of it. And then if the level of detail is greater than 0 0.25, well then I draw a pen, uh, otherwise I skip the pen. And then the final thing, um, is like, um, should I draw a ellipse or a rectangle based on how far I am? So just different, different sort of, as I, as I move further and further away from this item, I draw less and less. 
So that's that's like the level of detail on what you can do with that. Then I have the mouse event. So if uh, if I if I'm clicking the right mouse button, I want to rotate this item up and down. Like so, I could take this one item and rotate it alone. And we have this convenience function rotate, which just takes the number of angles it should be rotated. And um, if you see this this little piece of code there, I actually call event dot last scene pass dot x or dot y minus event scene pass dot y. Um, now the last scene pass uh, is added because we feel, or that's, when we do programming, it's one of the things that we always find ourselves needing. How many of you have implemented mouse interaction and found yourself caching the last uh, the last position of the mouse? Yeah, so it was a good choice. Last scene pass is the last position of the mouse. So you can actually, in the mouse move event, you can actually get like that value. So you can, uh, so based on that, I can then figure out how much did the mouse move, and I can just rotate it based on that. Otherwise, I just call the base class mouse move event. The last thing I did was to implement the real event. And if I held the control key down, I rotated the whole view. Uh, this is for the graphic, for the view. Uh, sorry, I didn't say that. And then if I'm not holding the control key, I scale the entire view. So the entire application is 132 lines of code. And the things I can do with it is like this. So in a sort of, um, I hope at least that we were fairly successful in adding con convenience functionality that make QGraphics view a lot easier to use than its predecessor. So, some minor things about porting from Q3 Canvas. QGraphics view is almost like QCanvas. The, the concepts are the same. We've added a lot of features, uh, but we tried to keep the API uh, at, least, at least similar because this, the concepts are the same. And we have a dedicated porting guide which describes on a function per function basis for all the, the functions that exist in, Q, in QCanvas what is the replacement for this in QCanvas? And what you need to do if there is no replacement? And then we have ported some examples ourselves, uh, and we provide the full source code for that that you can look at and, uh, and learn from, uh, which is the Canvas example and the Asteroids example from Q3. So the major differences that you'll notice is that um, the old QCanvas constructor took a pix map, which was the background tile. Uh, this is now replaced by the draw background. Uh, we feel that um, the draw background function supports much, much more. Uh, it's just that you now have to actually explicitly set it or you re implement this function. Uh, the animation support is different. In, uh, in the Q3 version or the Q Canvas classes, you had support for velocity in the items uh, by default. Now we have factored this out of the items partially because we want uh, we want the memory overhead on the items to be fairly small. A graphics item today has roughly 80 bytes overhead, I think, which gives you full transformation and full positioning and all that. While if we added velocity, that would have been another 16 bytes. So I mean, this is a, tra a trade-off. What we have instead is we have a class called QGraphics Animation. Uh, you can do most, most of these things with timer events. And we have a pretty cool class called QTimeline which is uh, a way of specifying a, um, a uh, sort of uh, a value going from A to B over a certain, given a certain amount of time. And you can have a linear interpolation, you can have a, a sort of a gradual uh, curve-based interpolation, and you can specify how it should be repeated. Should it, should it bounce and go back again? Should it go this, then start again, over again? There are a number of different ways you can do this. So to create standard animations, you would typically use a Q timeline rather than the standard, or rather than this velocity approach that was there before. Another thing that is gone is the chunk system. In Q3 Canvas, um, there was an internal uh, sort of an internal implementation um, of uh, internal optimization where we split the entire view into X number of uh, rectangles 
uh, and we just um, sort of figure out which which parts need to be drawn based on this based on these sort of dirty chunks. This was uh, something that was um, an internal detail, but it was publicly available, and in many cases you actually had to use that to do proper animation and to proper properly move things around. So. Um, we uh, we have now released it or replaced this with the BSP P tree, which is now an internal detail. You never have to worry about these things uh, at all. And uh, the last uh, last but not least, items are visible by default. So, um, according to the canvas example, uh, that was roughly a thousand lines of code, and the effort uh, done by uh, by the guy that did it was roughly one hour. The, the source code is then available there uh, in the examples graphics view ported canvas um, as part of the source distribution. The asteroids example, a little more than 2,000 lines of code um, took roughly two hours of work. Where, where much of that work uh, was because the, the example was written to show how to do animations, a feature that is now different, uh, implemented in a different way. So that's where most of the time went for that part. Yeah, and the source code is there available too. So all in all, um, this is graphics view. 